This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Tafidis. Weathering Heights by Emily Bronte. Chapter 18. The twelve years, continued Mrs. Dean, following the dismal period, were the happiest of my life. My greatest troubles in their passage rose from my little lady's trifling illnesses, which she had to experience in common with all children, rich and poor. For the rest, after the first six months, she grew like a larch, and could walk and talk, too, in her own way, before the heath blossomed a second time over Mrs. Linton's dust. She was the most winning thing that ever brought sunshine into a desolate house. A real beauty in face, with the Earnshaw's handsome dark eyes, but the Linton's fair skin and small features, and yellow curling hair. Her spirit was high, though not rough, and qualified by a heart sensitive and lively to excess in its affections. That capacity for intense attachments reminded me of her mother. Still, she did not resemble her, for she could be soft and mild as a dove, and she had a gentle voice and pensive expression. Her anger was never furious. Her love never fears. It was deep and tender. However, it must be acknowledged, she had faults to foil her gift. A propensity to be saucy was one, and a perverse will that indulged children invariably acquire, whether they be good-tempered or cross. If a servant chanced to vex her, it was always, I shall tell Papa, and if you reproved her, even by a look, you would have thought it a heart-breaking business. I don't believe he ever did speak a harsh word to her. He took her education entirely on himself and made it an amusement. Fortunately, curiosity and a quick intellect made her an apt scholar. She learned rapidly and eagerly, and did honor to his teaching. Till she reached the age of thirteen, she had not once been beyond the range of the park by herself. Mr. Linton would take her with him a mile or so outside on rare occasions, but he trusted her to no one else. Gimmerton was an unsubstantial name in her ears, the chapel, the only building she had approached or entered except her own home. Wuthering Heights and Mr. Heathcliff did not exist for her. She was a perfect recluse, and apparently perfectly contented. Sometimes, indeed, while surveying the country from her nursery window, she would observe, Ellen, how long will it be before I can walk to the top of those hills? I wonder what lies on the other side. Is it the sea? No, Miss Cathy, I would answer. It is hills again, just like these. And what are those golden rocks like when you stand under them? she once asked. The abrupt descent of Pennystone cracks particularly attracted her notice, especially when the setting sun shone on it and the topmost heights, and the whole extent of landscape besides lay in shadow. I explained that they were bare masses of stone with hardly enough earth in their clefts to nourish a stunted tree. And why are they bright so long after it is evening here? pursued. Because they are a great deal higher up than we are, replied I. You could not climb them, they are too high and steep. In winter the frost is always there before it comes to us. And deep into summer I have found snow under that black hollow with the northeast side. I oh, have been on them, she cried gleefully. Then I can go to you when I'm a woman. Has Papa been, Ellen? Papa would tell you, miss answered hastily, that I am not worth the trouble of visiting. The moors where you ramble with him are much nicer, and the first cross park is the finest place in the world. But I know the park, and I don't know those, she murmured to herself, and I should delight to look round me from the broad at tallest point. My little pony Minnie shall take me some time. One of the maids mentioning the fairy cave quite turned her head with a desire to fulfill this project. She teased Mr. Linton about it, and he promised she should have a journey when she got older. But Miss Catherine measured her age by months, and 
Now I am old enough to go to Bennett and Cracks, with a constant question in her mouth. The road thither wound close by Wuthering Heights, and girl had not the heart to pass it, Oh, she received us constantly the answer, Not yet, love, not yet. I said Mrs. Heathcliff lived above a dozen years after quitting her husband. Her family were of a delicate constitution. She and Edgar both lacked the ready health that you will generally meet in these parts. What her last illness was, I am not certain. I conjecture that died of the same thing, a kind of fever, slow in its commencement, but incurable, and rapidly consuming life towards the close. She wrote to inform her brother of the probable conclusion of a four months in this position under which she had suffered, and entreated him to come to her if possible. For she had much to settle, and she wished to bid him adieu, and deliver Linton safely into his hands. A hope was that Linton might be left with him, as he had been with her. His father, she would fain convince herself, had no desire to assume the burden of his maintenance or education. My master hesitated not a moment in complying with her request, reluctant as he was to leave home at ordinary cause. He flew to answer this, commanding Catherine to my peculiar vigilance, in his absence, with reiterated orders that she must not wander out of the park, even under my escort, he did not calculate on her going unaccompanied. He was away three weeks. The first day or two, my charge sat in a corner of the library, too sad for either reading or playing. In that quiet state she caused me little trouble, but it was succeeded by an interval of impatient, fretful weariness, and being too busy, and too old, and to run up and down amusing her, I hit on a method by which she might entertain herself. I used to send her on her travels round the grounds, now on foot, now on a pony, indulging her with a patient audience of all her real and imaginary adventures when she returned. The summer shone in full prime, and she took such a taste for this solitary rambling, that she often contrived to remain out from breakfast till tea, and then the evenings were spent in recounting her fanciful tales. I did not fear her breaking bounds, because the gates were generally locked, and I thought she would scarcely venture forth alone, if they had stood wide open. Unluckily, my confidence proved misplaced. Catherine came to me one morning at eight o'clock, and said she was then a rapid merchant, going to cross the desert with his caravan, that I must give her plenty of provision for herself and beast, a horse and three camels, personated by a large hound and a couple of pointers. I got together a good store of dainties and slung them in a basket on one side of the saddle, and she sprang up as gay as a fairy, sheltered by her white brimmed hat and glazed veil from the July sun, and trotted off with a merry laugh, mocking my cautious counsel to avoid galloping and come back early. The noted thing never made her appearance at tea. When Traveller the Hound, being an old dog and fond of its ease, returned, but neither Kathy nor the pony nor the two pointers were visible in any direction. I dispatched emissaries down this path and that path, and at last, when one ring in search of myself, there was a labourer working at a fence round a plantation on the borders of the grounds, and I inquired of him if he had seen our young lady. I saw her at the morn, he replied. She would have me to cut a razor switch, and then slept her a galloway over the hedge yonder, where it's lowest, and galloped out of sight. You may guess how I felt at hearing this news. It struck me directly she must have started for Penistone Crags. What shall become of her? I ejaculated, pushing through a gap which the man was repairing and making stretch to the high road. I walked, as if for a rager, mile after mile, till a turn brought me in view of the heights. But no Catherine could I detect far or near. The crags lie about a mile and a half beyond Mr. Heathcliff's place, and that is far from the Grange, so I began to fear night would fall ere I could reach them. And what if she should have slipped in clambering among them on the and been killed or broken some of her bones? My suspense was true and painful, and at first it gave me delightful relief to observe in hurrying by the farmhouse Charlie, the fiercest of the party lying on a window, with swell head and bleeding ear. I opened the wicket and ran to the door, knocking vehemently for admittance. A woman whom I knew, and who formerly lived at Giverton, answered. She had been serving there since the death of Mr. Earnshaw. Ah, said she, you are come seeking your little mistress. Don't be frightened. She's here safe, but I'm glad it isn't master. He is not at home, then, is he? I pounded quite breathless with quick walking in alarm. No, she replied, both he and Joseph are off, and I think they won't return this hour or more. Step in and rest you a bit. I entered and beheld my stray lamb sitting on the hearth, rocking herself in a little chair that had been her mother's when a child. 
heart was hung against the wall, and she seemed perfectly at home, laughing and chattering in the best spirits imaginable, to Hareton, now a great strong lad of eighteen, who stared at her with considerable curiosity and astonishment, comprehending precisely on the fluent succession of remarks and questions which her tongue never ceased pouring forth. "'Very well, miss,' I exclaimed, concealing my joy under an angry countenance. "'This is your last ride till Papa comes back. "'I'll not trust you with the threshold again, you naughty naughty girl.' "'Ah, Helen, she cried gaily, jumping up and running to my son. "'I shall have a pretty story to tell tonight. "'And so you're funny. "'Have you ever been here in your life before?' "'Put that hat on and home at once, sir. "'I'm dreadfully grieved at you, Miss Cathy. "'You've done extremely wrong. "'It's no use pouting and crying. "'That won't repay the trouble of heart, scouring the country after you. To think how Mr. Linton charged me to keep you in, and you stealing off so. It shows you're a cunning little fox, and nobody will put faith in you any more. What have you done? sobbed she instantly checked. Papa charged me nothing. He'll not scold me, Ellen. He's never cross like you. Come, come, I repeated. I'll tie the ribbon. Now, let's have no petulance. Oh, for shame! You're thirteen years old and such a baby! This exclamation was caused by her pushing the hat from her head and retreating to the chimney out of my reach. "'Nay,' said the servant, "'don't be hard on the bonny lass, Mrs. Dean. "'We may not stop. "'She'd fain have written for us. "'I feared you should be uneasy. "'Hilton offered to go with her, "'and I thought he should. "'It's a wild road by the hills.' "'Hilton, during the discussion, "'stood with his hands in his pockets, "'too awkward to speak, "'though he looked as if he didn't relish my intrusion. "'How long am I to wait?' "'I continued, regarding the woman's interference. "'It will be dark in ten minutes. "'Where is the pony, Miss Cathy? "'And where is Phoenix? "'I shall leave you, unless you be quick, "'so please yourself.' The pony is in the yard, she replied, and Phoenix is shut in there. He's bitten, and so is Charlie. I was going to tell you all about it, but you were in bad temper, don't deserve to hear. I picked up her hat and approached to reinstate it, but perceiving that the people of the house took her part, she commenced capering round the room, and on a giving chase, ran like a mouse over another and behind the furniture, rendering it ridiculous for me to pursue. Hedge and the woman laughed, and she joined them, and waxed more impertinent still. It's like cried in great irritation. "'Well, Miss Cat, if you were aware whose house this is, you'd be glad enough to get out.' "'It's your father's, isn't it?' said she, turning to Hareton. "'Nay,' replied, looking down and blushing bashfully. He could not stand a steady gaze from her eyes, though they were just his own. "'Who's then? Your master's?' she asked. He colored deeper, with a different feeling, muttered an oath, and turned away. "'Who is his master?' continued the tiresome girl, appealing to me. "'He told him at our house, and our folk. "'I thought he had been the honest son, and he never said miss. "'He should have done, shouldn't he have his servant?' Hareton grew black as a thunder cloud at this childish speech. "'I suddenly shook my question, and at last succeeded in equipping her for departure. "'Now get my horse,' she said, addressing her new kinsman as she would one of the stable boys at a crunch. "'And you may come with me.' I want to see where the goblin hunter rises in the marsh, and to hear about the fairishes, as he calls them. But be haste, what the matter could my horses say? I'll see the damn before I be thy servant, growled the lad. You'll see me what? asked Catherine in surprise. Damn, thou saucy witch, he replied. There, Miss Cathy, you see I have got into pretty company, interposed. Nice words to be used to a young lady. Pray don't begin to dispute with him. Come, let us seek for me ourselves and be gone. But, Ellen, cried she, staring fixed in astonishment, how dare he speak so to me? It wasn't to be made to do as I asked him. You, you wicked creature, I shall tell Papa what you said. Now then. I did not appear to feel these threats, so the tears sprang into her eyes with indignation. You bring the pony, she exclaimed, turning to the woman, and let my dog free this moment. Softly, miss, answered she addressed. You lose nothing by being civil. Though Mr. Hareton there, be not the master's son, he's your cousin. And I was never high to serve you. He, my cousin, cried Cathy with a scornful laugh. Yes, indeed, responded her approver. Oh, Ellen, don't let them such such things, pursued Red Crow. Papa is going to fetch my cousin from London. My cousin is a gentleman's son. That my... She stopped and wept outright. Upset at the bare notion of relationship with such a clown. Hush, hush, I whispered. People can have many cousins and of all sorts, Miss Cathy, without being any of the worst for it. Only the needn't keep their company, they'd be disagreeable and bad. Isn't that, isn't that my cousin, Ellen? 
She went and gathered the first grief from reflection and flinged herself into my arms for a refuge from the idea. I was much vexed at her and the servant for their mutual revelation, having no doubt of Linton's approaching rival, communicated by the former, being reported to Mr. Heathley, and feeling as confident that Catherine's first thought on her father's return would be to seek an explanation of the latter's assertion concerning her root-bred kindred. Hilton, recovering from his disgust at being taken for a servant, seemed moved by her distress, and having fetched the pony round to the door, he took to propitiate her a fine crook-legged terrier who helped from the kennel, and, putting it into her hand, bit a whist for a man's note. Pausing in her lamentations, she surveyed him with a glance of awe and horror, then burst forth anew. I could scarcely refrain from smiling at his antipathy to the poor fellow, who was a well-made, athletic youth, good-looking in features, and stout and healthy, but a tight in garments befitting his daily occupations of working on the farm and lounging among the moors after rabbit and game. Still, I thought I could detect in his physiognomy a mind only better quality than his father ever possessed. Good thing the last amid a wilderness of weeds, to be sure, whose rankness far over top of the neglected growth. And yet, notwithstanding evidence of a wealthy soil, that might yield luxuriant crops under other favourable circumstances. Mr. Heathcliff, I believe, had not treated him physically ill, thanks to his fearless nature, which offered no temptation to that curse of oppression. He had none of the timid susceptibility that would have given zest to ill treatment in Heathcliff's judgment. He appeared to have bent his malevolence on making him a brute. He was never taught to read or write, never rebuked for any bad habit which did not annoy his keeper, never led a single step to his virtue, or guided by a single precept against vice. And, from what I heard, Joseph contributed much to his deterioration, by a narrow-minded partiality which prompted him to flatter and pet him as a boy, because he was the head of the old family. And, as he had been in the habit of accusing Catherine Earnshaw and Heathcliff, when children, of putting the master past his patience, and compelling him to seek solace in drink by what he termed their awful ways, so at present he laid the whole burden of Harrison's faults on the shoulders of his usurper of his papa. If the lad swore, he wouldn't correct him, nor however culpably he behaved. It gave Joseph satisfaction, apparently, to watch him go the worst length. He allowed that the lad was rude, that his soul was abandoned to perdition, but then he reflected that Heathcliff must answer for it. Hatton's blood would be required at his hands, and there lay immense consolation in that thought. Joseph had instilled into him the pride of name, and of his lineage. He would, had he dared, have fostered hate between him and the present owner of the heights, but his dread of that owner mounted to superstition, and he confined his feelings regarding him to mutter new endures and private combinations. Now I don't pretend to be intimately acquainted with the mode of living customer in those days at Rotherham Heights. They only speak from hearsay, for I saw little. The village of the firm Mr. Heathcliff was near, and a cruel hand landlord to his tenants. But the house inside had regained its ancient aspect of comfort under female management, and the scenes of right coming in his time were not now enacted within its walls. The master was too gloomy to seek companionship with any people, good or bad, and he is yet. This, however, is not making progress with my story. Miss Cather rejected the peace offering of the terrier, and demanded her own dogs, Charlie and Phoenix. They came limping and hanging their heads, and we set out for home, sadly out of sorts, every one of us. I couldn't ring from my little lady how she had spent the day, except that, as I suppose, the goal of her pilgrimage was Peniston Crags, and she arrived without adventure to the gate of the farmhouse, when Hareton happened to issue forth, attended by some canine followers who attacked her train. They had a smart battle before their owners could separate them, but formed an introduction. Catherine told Hareton who she was and where she was going, and asked him to show her the way, finally beguiling him to accompany her. He opened the mysteries of the fairy cave and twenty other queer places. But being in disgrace was not favoured with the description of the interesting objects he saw. I could gather, however, that her guide had been favoured till she hurt his feelings by addressing him as a servant, and Heathcliff's housekeeper hurt hers by calling him her cousin. Then the language he had held to her rankled in her heart. She, who was always love and darling and queen and angel, with everybody at the Grange, to be insulted so shockingly at a stranger. I did not comprehend it, and Hardbroke had to obtain a promise that she would not lay the grievance before her father. I explained how he objected to the whole household at the heights, and how sorry it would be to find she had been there. But I insisted most on the fact that she revealed my negligence of his orders. He would perhaps be so angry that I should have to leave, and Cathy couldn't bear that prospect. She pledged her word, and kept it for my sake. After all, she was a sweet little girl. End of chapter 18